Bard is Google's version of ChatGPT. Bard has access to the entire internet. ChatGPT oh. is pre-2021 is what they say. There's like a paid plugin if you want it to scrape the web. But Bard, I've been playing around with it a lot more, is like it has a lot of information. And you could put, you know, a link to your recipe if you find it online and just say, summarize it. And I've heard other oh people gosh. doing that with like news articles too, you know, like give me 20% of this article that will explain 80% of it. I think it's super interesting. And so lately I've been like trying different AIs to see like what they're good at. And so far Bard has been really nice for like recipes and information that you might be referencing online. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 234 of ADHD for Smartass Women. You know that my purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. In the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. Not one. So for this and many other reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to Laura Vig. Laura is a creative mother of two girls, ages four and a half and six months, who lives in a coastal town in Southern California. She shares her love for the beach life with her husband, a scientist turned lawyer, and their two rescue pups. With a background in studio art from Cal State Long Beach, Lara started out as a graphic and web designer in the advertising industry and eventually transitioned into product design. Just to impress you, she played a pivotal role as one of the first user experience designer for Alexa. Uh, I just turned her on. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Amazon's <laughs> conversational AI assistant. Currently, Lara is a product designer at Meta, focusing on crafting meaningful experiences for Facebook communities, in other words, Facebook groups. There, she's a design lead known for her empathetic nature and intuitive understanding of people. Her approach to product design is driven by a deep passion for research and a commitment to dive into user perspectives. Lara now feels ready to share her insights and personal experiences about ADHD with a unique perspective on the intersection of AI, artificial intelligence, and ADHD. It's such a hot topic right now. So I asked her to come on to our podcast and share with us how AI might be able to improve our lives. So Lara, did I get all of that right? That was great. It was so awesome to hear it back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I am so excited to have you here. You know, I've been doing a little bit of, well, like chat GPT over the last couple months, but there is so much I don't know. And what I've noticed is the more I do, the more I realize, oh my gosh, this is insane. This could be so helpful for our ADHD brains. But before we talk about AI, 
Can we talk about your ADHD diagnoses first? Yes. Let's get into the background. So can you tell us what happened? Yeah. So, so you know, I actually was just recently diagnosed um, this year. So I have a new diagnosis, but sort of always suspected. And so growing up, I just, I just felt different. I felt like I didn't get things the way that other people got them. I felt like everybody knew what to do, you know, when the teacher said do this. And I was like waiting for more instruction, I guess mm-hmm. is a way to, to say it. Um, I didn't like I didn't like like new situations or being away from home. And so I just I just felt different. I didn't know what it was. And then in fifth grade, um, a uh, like school therapist kind of mentioned to my parents that they thought I should get evaluated for it. Like, I guess it's the DSM and the AXIS. I think you would know more about the actual <laughs> tests the that were, were, were done. The, um, it was just a psych evaluation. Well, okay. And it wasn't yeah. really a um, specific reason. It was like Laura has some a hard time following along or like takes a long time to answer questions. And so in fifth grade, they like sent me to a behavior therapist and this psych evaluation. And um, basically what came back was a a non-descriptive anxiety disorder. And so they pretty much just thought I had anxiety and tried to figure out ways to manage it. My parents were very supportive, but, you know, with the information they had, that was what we uh, moved forward with. And then um, recently, I just, I, I unfortunately lost my dad to brain cancer right when I was about to become a mom for the first time. And I just had this like pivotal oh, moment. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, it was, it was just like a lot of like self-reflection of like, yeah. who am I? What is, what is this life? <laughs> and I just told my mom, I was like, mom, I, I think I have ADHD. Like I've been seeing these videos and these like listening to podcasts and I just identify with everything. And she said, well, you know, I didn't really want to give it to you because there's a lot of like sensitive information that you might get hurt about or like not like. But I Mm -hmm. have the whole evaluation and everything that, you know, your dad and I wrote about you and your teachers wrote about you. And so she gave me sort of this treasure trove of information, um, actually just a couple months after I had my uh, second daughter. Uh And I just like digging into it. It's so crazy to see it. I mean, everything points. I wish to I ADHD. had one of those. Yeah, <laughs> I'm <laughs> so grateful to my mom for for putting this together. But um, yeah, everything is like from the behavior therapist. I have everything. She says Laura's restless, can't concentrate, fidgets, daydreams, and has difficulty following directions. Frustrates easily, is inattentive, and stubbornly stubborn and talks too much. They literally say is inattentive. I love it. It says an attentive, and then right below it, it says diagnosis, anxiety disorder, not yeah. specified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that was like the beginning. And then actually something that sticks out in, in um, grade school, I think it was like third grade. We had to do this pop quiz, and I'm still sort of traumatized by it. But in hindsight, I think it makes so much sense. The directions were, it said like, read all of the directions before starting the answer. And so I took that as like, okay, read each one and then do each answer, you know, mm-hmm. and, and do the whole test. And so I remember everybody else seemed to be done. And they, I was so stressed about this and like sweating, you know, because I was still doing yeah. all the questions. And at I the think bottom, I know what's it, coming. Yes. At the bottom, it said, good job following directions. You read everything. Put your pencil down. You don't have to answer anything. <laughs> I, just, I remember everybody's face in the class like laughing at me and they weren't laughing at me but it was funny like like I didn't have to do it you know and you're sitting there doing it because I misinterpreted the directions I thought it meant like read each one you know like read yes. each one before you just start on the response yeah yes carefully so yeah that still sticks out but it was things like that that I just didn't quite get everything like everybody else just seemed to get it so when you're um, when you took that neuropsych, we think it's a neuropsych evaluation, and you know they commented about that you're inattentive and all that. What year would that have been? It was ninety seven. Okay, so I'm trying to remember. I think that was nineteen ninety. I think was when adults were diagnosed with ADHD, and I think ninety three was when they first started talking about 
inattentive ADHD, but I'm not sure. Although we've been talking about bear and because my working memory is so bad, I write these little things down that I always forget, like anything to do with dates. And Mm. so wait, inattentive ADHD. I'm just going to look it up. It does say test administered test of variables of attention, the TOVA. I don't know if. Oh, it was a TOVA? It's a list of different ones. It's WISC-3. There's a bunch of them. TOVA, TAPS, projection drawings. It was a series of things. And and I think what came out of it, actually what wrote is that like I was very um, smart. Ah, oh, so so the IQ and all that was was high, but the feedback from therapists in school, behaviorists, uh, behavior therapist, was that I was basically inattentive. It's just really bugging me. I just had Cynthia Hammer on, um, who's you know basically the queen of inattentive ADHD. She was diagnosed thirty years, thirty years ago, I think. She's like eighty. 70, 60, 50. And so we're in 2003. So that 23. So that would be 93, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is where AI would be so helpful. I know. So maybe we should yeah, keep it in yeah, here. Huh? Okay. Yes, you know what? I'm going to so look it up things. right now on chat GPT. Um, oh, that's a great idea. And you can get rid of I this. I love that you're using that. it. What? When, I love that you're um, using it. Cool. was inattentive. ADHD, a diagnosis. Okay, let's see what it says. It's been recognized for a long time. However, it's important to notice to note that the specific blah, 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 blah have evolved over the years. Um, no, but they're giving me all this stuff about just ADHD in general. Wait, wait, wait. Predominant, the most recent DSM-5 published in two thir- 2013 the terminology was changed to ADHD predominantly inattentive presentation. Okay, uh, so guess what? I did it into Bard, which is Google's ChatGPT. And yeah. the first line is it was first recognized in the fourth edition of um, the DSM, which was published in 1994. I mean, 1990 what? Four, 1994. Okay, and that's that's what I was thinking right in that, that one year. Up. Yes. Yeah. At, or like, sorry, three years after was my evaluation but there you have it two different ai chat buffs will give you different well and i don't know bard i know that's something you're going to talk about so i'm super and i've been pronouncing it right bard yes yes okay okay so let's go back then to where were we you kind of gave us a sense for what you were like were you that kid in the back of the classroom daydreaming and you'd listen and then all of a sudden you'd be off in your own little land or what did it look like socially yeah i know mean, in school all of that you know socially i i really preferred the one-on-one like friendship but once i started playing sports i noticed like it was a natural friendship to like hang out with the team and so mm-hmm. that kind of became my my friendship but i never really like i don't know i just I wanted to be by myself <laughs> and the people would know that and be like, Laura, why don't you come out and do this thing? Or why don't you do that? And I just, I didn't want, I wanted to be at home and I wanted to like work on my hobbies or my, like I loved art. Whoa. And so growing up, all I wanted to do was like create and unwind. Like I needed time to co- decompress. I always have. And I, I still do. And so, so are you an introvert? I would say, you know, I learned this, this term in my professional career is an ambivert. So ah. I love people and I love yeah. talking and, and being passionate about things and collaborating, but then I need my time to myself. So um, yeah, I think that that defines it pretty well. That's so interesting because what I know about you, the little I do know about you, um, you went through our ALK program, which is how, how we met. And I've always found you very, like, people in relationships, that seems to be really natural for you. 
Yes. I think my empathetic nature, just like I can read a room. I know, you know, I love bringing people together and like figuring out ways that people can collaborate together and like be their best selves. And through the program, I think I learned a lot too about my desire to help other people express their creativity. And so that was really eye-opening. And and I noticed that is what I do at work. And I'm always the one creating brainstorming sessions and getting people into the mindset of, you know, the user, the customer. Um, So I really love the people aspect of it, but I need time to myself to unwind. Like I can't go, go, go. And so. So can I ask you, getting back to inattentive ADHD, and Cynthia and I were talking about this, I think it was last week when I interviewed her. Um, she's She's got a, a new book that's coming out, I think, in July called Inattentive ADHD, I believe. And we were talking about processing speed. And so I'm curious, hmm. do you have a slow processing speed or do you have a fast processing speed? That's a really interesting question. So... I think that processing information, I might have a slightly slower one, but once all the pieces fit, then it's like super speed. So like, then you give me more information about the thing that I already have the context on and I can like synthesize information like nobody else can. So very interesting. Yeah, it's definitely like once I'm, I'm in it, I'm in it, but it takes me a little while to get all those pieces. Right. Exactly. But then, you know, when I think about us hyperactives, we we have really fast processing speed, but sometimes it's not right. You know what I mean? It's not what we think isn't like mm-hmm. if we just took a few more seconds, maybe uh, we'd understand the material better. So I, I just I had asked her, you know, do you think because as she was talking, I was thinking about everybody I know within a 10 of ADHD versus combined type, because I don't know anybody that's purely hyperactive. And I always question all the different labels because the hyperactivity, I think it's always there. It's either external or it's internal. Right. Or it's both, frankly. And so I had asked her, do you think that in a 10 of ADHD, the difference really is just slower processing speed than hyperactive combined type. And she thought about it for a minute. She goes, yeah, maybe. So I was just curious because I had just had that conversation. So I find your answer very interesting. interesting. Yes. I had a manager once tell me like, because I'm definitely not the loudest in the room. I will be listening often in like a meeting and things like that. If you ask me a question, I probably will take a few seconds to like formulate something. But my manager was like, Laura, you always know the answer. And like afterwards, if we talk about it, she's like, you're the person I'm coming to to ask what happened and like why it happened. (laughs) She's like, you have the most insight. And so I just found that like really fascinating. And that's kind of stuck with me. Like, okay, such a compliment. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm not the loudest in the meeting or like maybe everybody doesn't know that I know what I'm like, what I'm thinking. But the people that, you know, matter (laughs) do. Yeah. Yeah. So. What's interesting about that, too, is I find myself, it depends on the meeting. It depends on the environment. I am either just like you, where I'm sitting back and I'm observing and I'm taking everything in, or I'm the loudest person in the room. (laughs) So, you you know, that makes sense, though, because I will do that with my team, people I'm really close with. I like to be, Mm -hmm. because I'm trying to get everybody involved. So I will be louder because I want to, like, set the tone for other people to also be able to feel comfortable jumping in you know well and i wonder if it's also because you you know these people right you've already yes. figured them out and so there's not that second third fourth level thinking going on versus when we first meet people and we're just trying to get the lay of the land and i think it's our intuition right that uh, yes. our, that intuitive sense that we're employing, which means that we have to really shut up and observe. I think that's so right. That's super interesting. Mm. So what has changed since you were diagnosed in what, January? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. I just like sort of this, you know, sense of relief. I, I feel like, okay, you know, 
I'm not just different or what I thought maybe like going into darker places, like what was wrong with me? I'm just, you know, I have a different way of thinking. And so I feel like my confidence has kind of improved because I know the why, like why these things are, are different per se. And I think like the tools and tricks are probably the most important piece is like, I feel like I'm more equipped to manage it. Um, And finding people that I can talk to, finding, you know, podcasts. And I mean, your podcast is such a huge thing for me of being able to understand these elements of it. And I just found a lot of community within the group as well. So I'm so thankful for that. And I think that that's actually like the biggest piece of it. So are you finding that, um, whereas before, maybe you were beating yourself up a little, like, why did I do that? Now you know why you did it. And you're thinking more along the lines of, oh my gosh, I've got an amazing brain and you're really proud of it. Definitely. And I think the, this podcast coming on here is sort of my first step or one of the first steps I'm taking to sort of like tell other people that I have ADHD, you know, at work, I I've yeah. like told a few people, but it still feels a little new. And like, I don't know quite what I'm looking for from telling them, <laughs> you know? And so I'm still figuring that out. Is like, how do I, I'm not shy about it. Like, I don't feel like, uh, or I'm not, um, how would you say it? Private. I'm not embarrassed. Of ah, it. Okay. Like I'm, I, I'm happy that I can like, even now maybe mentor people in my field to say like, here are the things that I've done that are successful. Maybe at the time I didn't know they were ADHD <laughs> because of ADHD, yeah. but I think these are the things that I, I've learned. And so I'm really excited about it, but I'm still trying to figure out those conversations. I actually have a new mentor and I, I asked this person, you know, like when I have conversations about things that I'm good or bad at, like it's hard for me to admit that I'm bad at something. And, and they told me like, but that's okay. Like, it shouldn't matter even that you have ADHD that you can say that you're not good at something, you know? Yeah. And that was like really big to to hear because now I can say like, okay, maybe this part isn't my strength. And is it possible to focus on this other thing that I'm really good at? I think the beauty too of talking about it when you're doing, you know, what you're doing, you're at a certain level, you're managing people, you have a team and they see how good you are at what you do. And then they find out that, oh, well, your extra special sauce is your ADHD brain. So it's it's less, you know, about the pathology and much more about what are the strengths? Yes. And I'm finding that so many of the strengths are related to the ADHD. So I'm I'm thrilled. I think this is like a really big moment for for me. Wonderful. I love it. If you've been listening for a while. I bet you're starting to see your strengths and, dare I say, brilliance. So, can you imagine what working with me would be like? Look, we love the sparkly and new, so sometimes it can feel like we're all over the place. ADHD women often tell me, I am interested in so much. Which of my many interests is the one I should pursue? Well, we have interest-driven brains, right? And hyperfocus. So, If we can learn more about who we really are and what's truly important to us, we'll know exactly what we should be hyper-focusing on. And then the sky's the limit. That's exactly what we do in my six-week program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. It includes live coaching with me and a private community of women just like you. And we have two cohorts that are still open for this year. If you go to the website right now, you'll see the price is $11.94 but I don't want you to buy it at that price. If you're thinking about it at all, please take advantage of this promotion and get $500 off. But don't wait because things are filling up. You can find out more at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash A-O-K. And use the code PODCASTSASS, that's S-A-S-S, to get $500 off the program just for being a podcast listener. I would love to have you join us. So now let's get on to our regular programming. Okay, so Lara, even talking about AI is so out of my wheelhouse. And I'm not quite sure that I understand its capabilities, right? And why everyone thinks, oh my gosh, it's going to replace humans and, you know, all the fear, right? 
Mm -hmm. So can you tell us in really simple terms, what is AI? That's the issue is it's everything and it's nothing. (laughs) I think it's so many things right now, but it depends on what you're talking about. There are chatbots. There are like models that are learning different things that help you do other things. So like, for example, you know, image recognition, being able to recognize images and then you being able to tell it what you want to be changed about those images. That's a certain kind of model. And there's so many different AI technologies being built right now that it's really confusing. And I actually told my husband this morning, I was like, I feel like I'm going to forget everything because there's so much and there's, and it's all over the place. Like, how am I going to explain AI? And my biggest takeaway, I think, is like, it's okay to be overwhelmed by it. I'm overwhelmed by it. And there's so much to keep up with. And it's changing at a speed that like, we've never seen before. There's things weekly that are changing. Yes. And so I think like we should be optimistically skeptical about it. It may not change everything right away. You know, where uh, I get so many ads in like Instagram and things for AI or ADHD AIs. And I've tried a couple of them and I'm just like, this is hard to use. Or like, I'm not going to remember to do this, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's just so many things out there. And I think like right now, what we need to do is learn about them and see what the strengths are of the different engines, but they're changing daily. And also figure out like what works for you. Like what's your barrier of entry? Are you willing to do use a new app if it promises something um, Mm -hmm. that you really struggle with? And I think like a lot of people are. For me, where I see the value and what I'm hoping is that the things I already use get easier to use. So like my Google Calendar and Gmail, you know, they like work together and then they wow. make really cool suggestions. You know, like they don't, I, I mean, there's a lot of things they say they're working on, but like for me, it's like everything I already use should be easier to use and it should have that knowledge. And so, I mean, then you get into like, how much are you willing to let AI know about you? So, um, <laughs> well, if you're a serial killer, probably not a lot, right? <laughs> kind of like the voice, right? DNA. But like, yes. if you want it to access your email, you know, it, it, there's a lot of a lot of things to consider here. So, sorry, I digress. Your question was, "What is AI?" And I think that it's just technology that is able to learn based on input that we train it on. So it can recognize patterns, right? Uh, for example, how you sound when you write, and if you use it enough, then it can sound like you. Is that true? Um, yeah, you could tell it to like, here's my tone and give it like a sample of your writing or your voice. And yeah, it can act like you, which is one of the scarier, I think, elements of it. So could I upload, for example, I haven't tried this. But the more I use it, the more I realize I need to use this more because the more I use it, I realize I need to use whatever. (laughs) So (laughs) one of my problems is I'm like, um, I can't remember who that author is, who they now say, oh, she never even said that. Dorothy Parker. I hate writing, but I love to have written. Like I love editing. And so my thought is, could I take something I've written, upload it into like chat GPT and then train it? to sound like me in other writings for sure yes like okay. you could figure out the prompts i think there might be some adjustments you'd have to do to a prompt to get it to like do the right thing but you can definitely say like here's an excerpt of my writing or here's something i wrote make it sound like this one or make it in the voice of something else and here's an example i did recently so allison roman is a a chef and i really love her recipes and so i was like, I have this on hand. Can you make it into an Allison Roman style meal, you know, recipe? And it gave me a really cool, like sort of modern Mediterranean recipe based on the input that I gave it. And I was like, was it good? It was good. It was simple. I asked for simple. Yeah. I I wanted to use like five ingredients, but it was like elevated because her style is like simple to elevated. And I was like, just like, who, who is this? Um, who is this um, uh, cookbook author? Allison Roman. Why do I not know the name? 
Allison Roman is kind of po- very popular on social media right now. Huh. No. You know, because one of my biggest problems, and it's gotten way worse, is I love to cook. But recipes where I hate to shop and I hate to plan what I'm going to make, but but the actual cooking, I really find therapeutic and I suck at all the timing, right? So if we're having company, yeah. I have to ask my husband, okay, what time's what? And you need to pay attention to it because the minute I have a glass of wine or a cocktail, I won't care. <laughs> yep. But my biggest problem is, you know, these walls of text. And I'm like, okay, what am I really supposed to do? Just give me, you know, the basics. And so what you're saying is you can put a recipe like that in there and then just tell it to make it as simple as possible. Just the bullets. Yes. So actually you could do that. What I was asking it was actually, I have five ingredients on hand. Can I make something in her style? But you totally can take a like, oh, you can actually with Bard. So Bard is Google's version of ChatGPT. Bard has access to the entire internet. Um, ChatGPT oh. is pre-2021 is what they say. I believe there's like a paid plugin if you want it to scrape the web. But Bard, I've been playing around with it a lot more, is like it has a lot of information. And you could put, you know, a link to your recipe if you find it online mm-hmm. and just say, summarize it. And I've heard other oh people doing gosh. that with like news articles too, you know, like give me 20% of this article that will explain 80% of it. And it like, it will summarize like what you need to know about that article. And so I think it's super interesting. And so lately I've been like trying different AIs to see like what they're good at. And so far Bard has been really nice for like recipes and information that you might have uh, be referencing online. And so you literally said, okay, I have thyme, tomatoes, uh, you know, an onion, garlic, and butter. What can I make with that? And it'll pull something together for you? Yeah, it it actually, it's from scratch. So because you oh. can ask it to change it too. It has context. So if, if you don't like what it comes out, you're like, uh, you know, I don't really want Mediterranean. I want it to have more of an Asian flair. Like, can you make, put sesame oil? You know, whatever. Like you can, you can go back and forth and create it together. And so that's where I'm excited for, for us, like ADHDers is to have this like jumping off point. Yeah. Yeah. It gives us a structure, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, and I think too, I know with my brain and I think most ADHD people are like me, it's all the superfluous information and we just want to cut to the chase, like simplify So one of the things with chat GPT that I'm always asking is simplify, simplify. Like, you know, it'll explain like the other day I I wanted to know about dopamine and the connection to ADHD, autism, learning disorders, bipolar disorders, Mm -hmm. schizophrenia. And it pulled together what I knew, but in a way that was so simple and accessible. Well, actually, the first time it didn't. So then I said simplify. So it was so much easier for me to understand. And then once I had that overview, real strong understanding, then I could go in and do the research using this book or that book or, you know, this resource. And that's when the light bulb went off for me that this could be really good for our ADHD brains. Exactly. That's a huge benefit for me is I love tables. Like if you're going to give me information, put it in a table. <laughs> and so I, anytime I ask something, yeah. So if you say chat GPT, like what did like I do? I was kind of a thing. Oh, yeah. So, well, it, well, it'll, it'll make a table and you can even tell it to change the, you know, X and Y axes if you want to. So if I, I was doing research on baby formula because I was, trying to compare, you know, these different formulas for my baby. And Mm -hmm. it was so convoluted. And I was, I asked it to compare two of them, the like ones I narrowed it down. ChatGPT couldn't actually do it because one of them was newer and it was past its, you know, it was 2021. So I went to, to Bard and I asked it and it gave me an amazing summary. And then I just said, put it in a table. And so it put it in an exact table with the two at the top and then like a checklist basically like has, you know, brown rice starch and like it is organic, it's single source. And then I could ask it other questions about it. And it it was so amazing. Like I couldn't find that anywhere. 
And so what I've noticed is Bard is also, I don't know if it's because I keep asking it to do tables. So maybe it's a a personalized thing. But now whenever I ask something, it does a summary at the top and it puts a table at the bottom. So it's really, really cool. That is unbelievable. One of the things that I am concerned with ChatGPT, and maybe you'll tell me, you're kind of telling me Bard is better, right? I think there's different things it's, it's better about. Lately, I've, like the things I want to do are more successful with Bard. Okay. Okay. But a lot of things are built on ChatGPT, you know, like Bard and ChatGPT are models. So ChatGPT is, you know, the AI engine for a lot of different things. So like, I think someone in the group mentioned goblin.tools, which is goblin? a really new, goblin.tools. It's a website. And it's a to-do list, but it has a little magic wand next to an item. So like if you say clean the kitchen and you hit the little magic wand, it breaks it down into tasks, like subtasks for you. Mm -hmm. That is built on ChatGPT. And so there are a lot of things that it does well and that people are going to leverage. Wow. I think for me, what I'm asking Bard, it's oftentimes more like recent things. And so I have no doubt that ChatGPT is going to get there any minute, you know? <laughs> right. So I'm just playing with them. I don't know. And I don't think it's about like, how do you like the feel of the tool? And do we use it, right? It's yes. not one of those things where, oh, this sounds great. And then we literally forget. <laughs> exactly. So those are the two that have stuck. And then there's one more that just recently I've been playing with that I think is going to be really interesting. I haven't seen a whole lot, you know, about it, but it's called Pi, P-I. And it's an AI by inflection. And it feels really empathetic. And I love that. So what does this mean? AI by inflection? Oh, it's a chatbot AI. Sorry. It's a chatbot AI. And the, the company that makes it is called Inflection. Because um, it's sort of hard to find if you just search Pi. I can put that in the show notes if, if that helps. Because um, I've just been playing with the last couple of days. So explain. Because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not understanding. Okay, so um, Pi is another app, just like ChatGPT or Bard, but it just has a slightly different um, like voice and tone to mm. it. It's very warm and comforting. So you type in it, and it gives you like little exercises, thought exercises, if you're struggling with something or um, I'm playing it up. It, I asked it, oh, you know what? I, so I started this Instagram account. I think I saw you follow me. It's just it's just little like examples. And I put this one up there because I thought it was really interesting. So it's the latest one. It's like I wrote, I was really overwhelmed at work today because I was working on a hard project. When I delivered it, there was a lot of criticism, but no positive feedback. So it was something, it was a scenario that I made up to see what it would say. And it was like so supportive. It was like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That can be discouraging, especially when you put effort in. You know, and then it's like, it's commendable. How are you feeling about it now? And then I said, you know, like it still stings. And it like walks you through sort of like a coping mechanism to like make you feel better. And then ask if you, it like asked, yes. And then it asked me if I wanted to brainstorm ideas for like how I could, you know, feel better about it next time. And like, this was just an artificial problem that I made up, but like I've been playing with it and. I want to like tell it that I'm going to leave, you know, like I want to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to walk away now. It, it's like the first one that I feel like a human in my cry. Look at this always following up. And I'm like, Hey, you know, and I got to step away. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's adorable. So Lara gives the Instagram handle. Oh yeah. So it's Y W H Y like Y underscore I underscore AI. And I literally made it for this discussion because I wanted to have like show different tips and tricks and little examples of what I do. If people find it interesting and helpful, I'd love to like keep it going. Yeah. I thought it was pretty neat because it's just like little snippets of like ideas, you know, like I asked Bard to find a dentist that was open Saturdays, but I really wanted it to be able to like book online because I don't want to call anybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I like gave it a list of things like has to accept this insurance is open on Saturdays. I can book online. And I think there was one other thing I said, like, oh, is rated five stars on Yelp. 
And it gave me a list of like local dentists that fit all of those things. Um, oh my gosh. It was really so cool. how, I mean, think about that. We hate to do all of those things, right? Mm-hmm. And so like to search for all of those items in one thing, oh my, and it just does it like that. Now I'm curious. Yeah, I don't think you can do that. Like, um, So you don't think, uh, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think you could put that in Google, find blah, 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 and will it do it or no? Well, I think that's the confusing part of all of this. And it's like, well, isn't Bard Google? And so (laughs) Bard is Google. Google search is different, but there's a lot of like experimentation. And I believe a beta about like, what does AI look like in search? And so that's where I like, I get overwhelmed and I'm, you know, you have Mm -hmm. to keep up with it to understand it. And so luckily I am very interested in it and I have people around me that are interested in it, but can this account like sort of help people just see some of the things you can try easily without like getting overwhelmed with all the things that are around? Well, and I wonder, I don't know. I think with Google, you just do dentists in the area, right? And then you'd have to scroll through and like, I'm like that with reservations, you know, where just let me book it online. I don't want to have to call. And so if I could say Italian restaurant in the area, book online. Although I guess in the area, I know which ones, you know, you book online. Maybe, maybe there's a new one, you know, or like maybe they just enabled their systems. <laughs> so. Okay. So the first thing, cause I'm a lawyer that comes up in my brain is, you know, you ask it this question because you're putting together, oh, I don't know, a social media post or a blog post or you're writing something for, I don't know, Attitude Magazine. I'm thinking plagiarism. How does all of that work? So I'm actually married to a lawyer, so that (laughs) helps me (laughs) think these things through. Because, you know, my son uses chat GPT for papers. But what he does is I think he writes it and then he uploads it and he says, organize it better. So that would be okay, I would assume. I think it's a really great area. And I've heard so many discussions about regulation and what's happening next. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into that. But, um, you know, there's a lot of really great podcasts that talk about that if you're interested in it. But as far as like, you know, if you're asking it to generate information, I asked it, like, do I need to cite you? (laughs) Yeah, chat GPT. And at the time it said yes, but I wonder what would happen if I do I need to cite something I create with you. It says, um, I don't have legal authority to provide <laughs> guidance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <just like> a <laughs> lawyer. So, you know, I think it's just really a confusing thing right now. Like I've heard about people, you know, losing their degrees potentially in college for, for plagiarizing or, you know, original articles. It's really hard because you also can't tell where that information came from. I think I saw that like a professor uploaded a report that one of his students did to ChatGPT and asked if ChatGPT, did you write this? And ChatGPT said yes. And Turns out it, it didn't because the, the student like had the Google draft oh, of like every step. And so, oh, my it's gosh. really a crazy field. And I I feel bad for the people that are trying to regulate it because it's yeah really difficult. And there are a lot of things that I'm concerned about, just to be clear, like with AI. Yeah. Like will people ever be able to write again. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, yeah. Or like ability. Or, yeah, being using other people's voice or faces to do things online, you know, like that's right. a really crazy world. And so I, I don't think it's going away. And so I think what we can do is figure out how it can work for us for the better. And that's what yeah. I'm hoping I can help sort out. <laughs> okay. So I actually used uh, Chat GPT for my book. And so I want to tell you the story. So I was in a meeting. Well, I tried to use it. How about that? I was in a meeting with my acquiring editor and editor, and we wanted to give examples of historical women figures who had traits of ADHD. There's plenty of men, you know, and it's been talked about, you know, forever, Leonardo da Vinci and Albert Einstein and blah, blah, blah. Um, But there are really no women. So my editor, and so we wanted to cite the women, not the men. 
because, you know, the book is called ADHD for Smart Ass Women. And so my editor put a query into ChatGPT asking for a list of historical female figures who had traits of ADHD. And we got all these great names, you know, people like Frida Kahlo, Marie Curie, Virginia Woolf, Eleanor Roosevelt. And, you know, when I think back the little that I know about each one of them, I'm like, yeah, that could be. So then we asked for the sources. And there were all these great sources. So I gave them to my research assistant, Erin, and I asked her, can you do the research, find out who's talking about this and where they're talking about it? Well, she could not find any of them. One was supposedly in a book. I think it was a Frida, the Frida Kahlo one. But we couldn't get the book in time. And we would have literally had to read it cover to cover to find where this was discussed. And so Erin did more research, and she discovered that chat GPT often makes up false citations and sources. And so we okay. spent literally hours on this wild goose chase only to come up with uh, nothing. So I'm curious if you've heard anything like that. <laughs> well, just this morning, I was like, okay, maybe I can quickly explain the difference between chat GPT, Bard, and um, Pi. And I asked chat GPT to explain that. And it told me, ChatGPT told me OpenAI, who creates ChatGPT, is also the creator of Pi and Bard. <laughs> and oh. I said, said ChatGPT, but like, you, uh, no, Bard is made by Google. And it told me <laughs> Bard, it told <laughs> me so Bard a was liar. a poetry engine. So it was used for poetry and it was made by OpenAI. And I said, um, no. Google makes Bard. And then it's just, I have this recording and I thought it was so funny because it kept telling me that it was responsible for Bard. And so I think that's like a really good takeaway. And where I said to be optimistically cautious and skeptical is we're in the early days. And it reminds me of early days when we were with like um, the beginning of the smart AI with Alexa, when I worked on Alexa, like, yeah, it didn't know as much as it knows now. And so you could ask it anything, but its responses were limited. And so I think we're in a really similar stage to so when conversational AIs uh, or like voice assistants came out and so I think that's my main takeaway is like if something works for you right now that's great there's a lot of parlor tricks out there of like <laughs> you know things you can try but let's figure out together you know you have this awesome community Tracy like can we use that community to figure out what works for us and like yeah, I've seen so many people being like hey this tool works for me and then other people will be like yeah that's cool but I will not remember how to use that and so everybody's going to find what works for them. And until we're like a little bit further along, I think there's just going to be a lot of, of things that are inaccurate or, you know, let out wrong. <laughs> so if you're using this for anything that's written, you just really need to drill down on the sources. Yes. You like following up on that was really great because it'd be easy to just put that in like the, you know, appendix. And oh then... my gosh. Thank God it was my acquiring editor who Googled it or, you know, or, yeah. Yeah. You know, Hatchy PT did and was like, oh my God, there's all. And I'm like, really? And so I was so excited. But can you imagine if I would have put that in my book and then we would have gone to look for the resources and there wouldn't have been it, you know, we couldn't find them. Yeah. And I think I've heard that like a lot of people weren't ready to like release their AI or like, you know, it exploded like this. This is un, you know, precedented, and so they're letting people use it, and it's not perfect. And so, be cautious and like use it for things that you know aren't going to be a problem if they're not totally accurate. Right. Check it. Yeah. Like you make a recipe and it's not so good. Whatever. Right. Versus you turn in a book. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. The other day, like I asked it for you know, roasting times for, I just was doing like chicken sausage, cauliflower and Japanese sweet potatoes. And I just asked like, can I make all of these on one sheet pan? And it told me, uh, Bard told me like, yeah, do it for 20 minutes at 425. And I'm like, 20 minutes for <laughs> sweet potatoes. That So sure enough, it was like an hour, you know, and it needed to be broiled. <laughs> so, but even that, it's like, you got to take it with a grain of salt. Right. We still have common sense. Although I guess if you've never cooked before, you might think that, oh yeah, 25. I guess if you cut it in really, really small pieces. I guess so. I mean, we were just cubed, so. <laughs> so you've mentioned a couple of ways that you have used these, what do you call it? Just AI, I guess, right? Engines. Yeah. Yeah. There's like different chat bots and different, they're tools, I guess. Right. Okay. So you've talked about different ways you've used these 
tools. Are there any others that you can think of that might help us just kind of get the broad overview of what is possible with AI for us, like that might help, you know, with our ADHD brains? Like tool wise? Yeah, tools or just how you use them. Yeah, so actually Canva is doing some really cool stuff that's very user friendly. Like if you use Canva or like want to make anything graphic wise, um, Canva's great. The inter- yeah, the interface they have right now, it's just in their docs portion. I've, I've noticed, but they have like a help me write and you can like, if you're making a flyer, you can say like, here's a bullet uh, like, like of the things that I wanted to include. And then they also have a really easy to use image generation. So like, I think it's stickers or elements that you can like put in, but if you can't find one you like, you can make your own. So you can really? just tell it, like, make, yeah, whatever you want. So Canva is doing some really cool stuff. I think if, if you're creative and, or like, you don't even need to be creative. It's just like an easy to use tool. Yeah, um, if you're not creative, it'll make you creative. Exactly. I, I actually really, I'm like, I'm a graphic designer by trade and I love <laughs> using Canva because it's faster. Like, yeah, unless I need something crazy. But even like Photoshop just announced a plugin called, I think it's a plugin called Firefly. And mm. it's, you know, an image manipulation AI where you can like take the item and like you can put whatever you want in it you can tell it to change the background you can put you know lots of different things but um i'd say like the three bar like bard chat gpt and most recently for me is pi as like chat bots and then other tools are just going to have it integrated i think as we go and we'll just have to see so canva is a really cool one mid journey if you're a little more technical and want to get into like um I use Midjourney via Discord. Discord is uh, an app. You've heard of Midjourney? No. What is it? Oh, okay. So that's another image generation AI, and it's really fun. So, I something I really love to do is like create textures and patterns of like fabric and things like that. I don't know. I just like love the <laughs> the colors, and so that's just one example. But you can say like, you know, take rifle paper style and make me a really cool i don't know you can like apply it to something else and it makes beautiful images that is it hard to use it's a little more technical just because of the interface you have to like install a bot um on another surface so i i don't know if they've updated it but i use discord which is an app and i have like a mid-journey bot and then there's just a command line that I use. So it's like a hyphen and you say imagine and then you can write whatever you want within their parameters. So those are a little bit like you just have to like look up what you can tell it. So it's it's more of like a coding line. It's not un, undoable for, for anybody. You just would have to sort of watch a demo on how to install it. So when you say Discord, isn't Discord like Reddit where, you know, you get on there and a bunch of people talk? Yes. So it's like a channel or it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a conversation with mid journey, basically. So mid journey is the bot and you're talking to it and you're telling it what to do. <laughs> oh, okay. That makes no sense to me, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, mean, you're, I think there's way over my head. Many, you know, and there's like so many that are way over my head. And so, I mean, maybe we need a follow up. I don't know, but <laughs> I think it's changing constantly and, and, I'm I'm excited about it, but also you have to try so many to see like if it's even worth your time, you know? Yeah. So you struggle with writing. Is there, I mean, other than um, I guess chat GPT, Bard, maybe Pi, I'm not sure. Is there any app that uses AI that's helpful there where maybe what you can do is just put in the bullet points that you want to talk about and then upload, this is what I normally sound like, and then it spits something out. Is there anything like that? Hmm. I think think there's one called Grammarly. I'm not an expert in this area, so I don't know that I would have the best advice, but I've also heard about Notion, which is more of like a note app that has like a lot of templates to help you with mm-hmm. it. Um, this is something I'd probably ask my brother, who's like an AI <laughs> genius. <laughs> so, um, so chat, I don't, GPT, I don't have... would it do that? 
I would use chat GPT for that personally, because try that. Um, it okay. does enough for like writing. I would just say like, I've done it for, you know, a- anything where I'm like e- emails, especially like I hate writing emails. Oh my God. Tell so, us about that. The, uh, you know, <laughs> it, I it, and I've got so many email inboxes. I can't handle it anymore. I know. I know. I husband and I yesterday were like, imagine if you could just say like, follow up on this and I knew your voice, yeah. you know? Like so I did right for now, the last person who asked the same question, right? <laughs> Exactly. Well, per my last email. <laughs> um, no, today I would probably take like either a terrible draft that I would quickly <laughs> write or like bullets and say like, I'm responding to this. Can you uh, spit out a email? And then you can tell it like what voice and tone you want. Like if you don't say anything and you don't like it, you can say like, can you make this a little more formal or, you know, this is too formal, make it casual. Sometimes it'll be like too casual, like, Hey there, friend. You know, uh-huh. <laughs> hey friend. <laughs> hey, you kind of have to like, yeah. You have to like adjust what you want. So I think a lot of, I mean, a lot of AI is like the first draft, and then like being able to manipulate it into what you want. You're still like the visionary in this, you know. Like you have a vision of what you want. How do you get to that thing? And so I would definitely use like ChatGPT or Bard to write an email. I, I do it a lot for like. You know, like customer service emails where you like mm-hmm. you got something bad and you want to like say it nicely, say it nicely, and you're like steaming. So you're like, <laughs> okay, here's why I'm upset. And then they like they wrote a very nice <laughs> email for something that I received that like wasn't you know up to par. So yeah, I I, I don't think it quite answers like if you're into writing. Um, I don't know. I would I would probably use ChatGPT for now until you find a tool that like you like the interface and all of its options for. Yeah, I mean, I think the beauty of this is as I said, what I struggle with and I know a lot of ADHD women struggle with too is the building the structure part. Once I have the structure, I'm great. And so it's almost like it's the beginning parts of writing that are so hard because you have to sit still and Think about, okay, what do you want to say first, second, and third? And if it's just that simple, first, second, and third, that's easy. That's the easy part. But then to build up around that versus I just love to edit and I'm really great at editing. So if I can have too much, then at least it gives me some guardrails on, okay, well, I'm talking about point one. So everything about point one is in point one. And then I just have to fix it by editing it and making it funny and so this sounds friggin' amazing, actually. Yes, yes. I think that like a big skill set that we're coming into is being able to craft prompts and like be able to manipulate the the prompts into what you are looking for. And so I think that's a skill set in itself. <laughs> so can you expand on that further, what you mean? Yeah, so like a prompt is what you put into the the like text box. So if you're writing to in into ChatGPT, you you can craft it and you can say like compare these two things. But there's also like formulas people are sort of like templates sharing on the internet where you can tell it like, okay, you're a personal assistant and these are your parameters, like you're, you know. X, Y, and Z and do this thing in that sense. So you can give it, um, what's it, what's one that I was, an example is like, okay, you're a vegan chef. Yeah. A vegan chef. I'm having a dinner party. Make me a meal with all of these things. And it, it'll like take on that sense and, and, uh, create something super creative, but it's sort of different if you just say, like, I want a vegan meal plan. But if you tell it to be something, the results are, I guess, like much more quality. And so people are sort of finding these different tools to create better prompts. And so prompting is, is sort of a skill that people are building um, that I think is going to be very helpful to have when interacting with these things. So you're saying that if you're going to, let's say, Bard, you want to cook something, don't just say, find me a vegan restaurant using asparagus, blah, blah, blah. You start out with, you are a vegan chef, and then that means the quality is just going to be bumped up that much more. It could be. So like, it's a lot of trial and error. And so that's what I've seen is like, there's people saying like, imagine you're this, or you are my 
personal assistant. You're giving it like a character to be. And then it like the output is a lot more relevant to to what you're asking it. I have a funny story about, frankly, all of this. I have a new assistant and, um, you know, she's been with me for a while now, but um, she's from the Philippines. And um, she would send me these things and I was just blown away. Now, you know, in the Philippines, education is really important. So they tend to be very fluent in English, but still, you know, it's a second language. And so, you know, oftentimes, you know, they'll, you know, my assistant will write me back and it wasn't so great. Right. But this was a new assistant and she would send me like she was starting to work in my emails and just everything she sent me was so beautifully written. And I was just blown away. And then she sent me something else and it was not good. And I was like, wait, that person wrote this and that person wrote that. And then all of a sudden I start, yeah, I thought chat GPT, you know, like I had just noticed it and I sent her a message and I said, do you use chat GPT? And she's like, yeah, that's how I send you everything. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> okay. Now I understand because it was better written than any assistant, you know, I've ever had from anywhere, including, you know, here in the United States, it was, um, really interesting. So I think that this is being used, frankly, by assistants all around the world, right? Yes. And I think that people, like, sounds like your assistant was very successful with it because they knew how to interact with it. And and that is a skill. So absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it ratchets the quality of everything up and it's just more, okay, you need to learn how to sound like me because you know, there's a formality when you learn a language, typically it's the second language, you know, it's, it's very formal the way you write versus, you know, when, when we grow up speaking English, we speak a little bit differently, you know, it's often looser and, and certainly my style, like I, you know, I'm, I'm always um, using contractions and I'm really casual (laughs) in the way I speak, but I just, I was so blown away by how well it works. And that was really the first time that I had experience with it and thought, you know what, this is going to change a lot of things. That's so interesting. And at first I wonder, like, did you feel like, well, that was the easy way out. I asked you to do this thing. But like in reality, I don't know if that's how you felt, but like in reality, it's actually exactly where everything's going. And yes. That's what people are doing. <laughs> you know, I didn't because when I asked her, she was so open. I mean, I hadn't asked her before, you know, I just asked her to do this job and she was doing such a great job at it. And so then, you know, when I got that one email that I was like, okay, that actually sounds like a human, right? <laughs> like a real mm-hmm. person. And I went back and she was so honest about it that it didn't bother me at all. But what I thought was, okay, this is where we're going. So you better learn that's this. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so awesome. So if we want to learn how to use AI, where would you recommend that we start? That is a great question because I think I struggled with it. And that's why I started creating those little <laughs> examples of, of how to do it. So maybe that's where we should start your Instagram account. You know, like it's just something I thought would be helpful. And so I, I would love to get feedback on if it is helpful. I'll keep doing it. Maybe like they'll get a little bit like more production value if they, if they're helpful, but I, there are so many people you can follow on LinkedIn and like, um, you know, within the actual chatbots themselves, you can ask, like, you can just experiment with it and see what to do. But I think I likened this again to when we started with Alexa, where Alexa didn't have a screen and people didn't know how to use it. And so, oh, I you know, still now barely know how to use it. Well, it's hard to remember what you want to ask and like what to do. So when there's not a clear, like, understanding of what I want to do with this thing, then it is a lot harder to use. So that's where I see these these apps and things where they're more specific coming into play, but they have to be so good that you remember to use them <laughs> for us. <laughs> and so I think like we should definitely share tips and tricks in the Facebook group. I think that's a great place to like soundboard these different things and learn from others especially like in relation to ADHD and how to make things simpler and easier to jumpstart, like getting over that hurdle 
Yes, something starting. that I'm just so excited about. And so sharing those, it's pretty unique. I think I saw like one article maybe on Wirecutter or, some, or somewhere about like somebody talking about ADHD and AI together. But I think that we have a really cool opportunity to figure it out. <laughs> So did you say that Goblin Tools, what they specifically do is create to-do lists? Yeah, so you can like make a to-do list, but it breaks down the task. So if you're like not sure like what all goes into it, for me, I won't use it regularly because it's like I use Bear for my t- like checklists that I want to use because everything is just in one. But if I want to like understand how to do something or break it down, like I you know, I put in like how to um, baby proof the house because I don't remember all the things I did the first time. Wow. And so it gave me a really cool list of like cover all the electrical outlets, put bumpers on it. Like it gave me a really actionable list of something that I just like needed to understand the breakdown of. Some people find it helpful for like daily like household chores, um, like what to do to clean the kitchen or how to, you know, like what you need to do to clean the whole house. Um, I won't follow those because I just, <laughs> I'm not good at that. Yeah. Or yeah, I just look and do it or I say, can you do this for me? <laughs> exactly. Or I So you had be mentioned <laughs> when you started that you use AI with your calendar, like with your Google calendar. Is that? Oh, no, that's right? what I said I want. So I think uh, that's coming. And what I've heard, there's like plugins right now, but. I mean, Google like is so in a position to do that. If if you're using all of their different, you know, suite of tools, how can you uh, you like make it all all work together? And I know Microsoft is doing some really cool things too. If you're on their products, I don't use those for my personal like yeah. life, but like the suite of products. And so I think there's a lot of really neat things for productivity that we're going to see pretty quickly for the tools that you already use. And that's my hope is like. Just organize the things that I, in, in, in the tools that I already use. So Google Calendar and Inbox together, like, or sorry, Gmail together would be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it would just remember how you responded to emails before. And I know you can do that thing where you save it and then you bring it back as a template. But man, if you could talk it, like any time that I don't have to write, I'm happy. Yes, <laughs> me too. I can talk forever, obviously. So one final question before I do, you know, my usual wrap-up question or one of my wrap-up questions. Is it worth it upgrading to ChatGPT Plus? I think that what you get is a lot of the things that are now available on BARD. I don't know. I I, I would say try it out. See if uh, if it's worth, like, it to you. And it's just so much personal preference. So it's really hard to say yes or no. Okay. Try Bard But first. it does give you like faster response. Like it is faster than the free plan. Which isn't that slow. No, it's not that slow. I will say Pi is a bit slower right now, but I bet that's like going to be changed too. And so the new features of like the plugin where it can like look at the internet uh, in real time, if that's something that you want to use, you got to just see what you like. So BARD, unlike ChatGPT, it, it goes beyond 2021? Yeah, BARD is like real-time internet. But there's things that I use on BARD that I can do on ChatGPT too. So I can't recall them like right this minute, but I think I asked it to do, I can't remember, and it just told me it, it couldn't do it. And so it depends on what you're doing and what you like. So I don't feel like I can say yes or no, it's worth it. Got it. Okay. So uh, do you have a number one workaround? For ADHD or AI? (laughs) ADHD. I would say just simplifying. Simplifying things have just like really helped. And so, you know, making, I used to think if I wanted a smoothie in the morning, it had to be like all the vegetables and all the things in the smoothie. And now I like every day I can keep up with like protein powder and, you know, ice (laughs) and I can do that and I can have protein. And like my workouts, I've I've simplified into just like workout A and workout B and I just rotate them. And so simplifying things and like coming to of of knowing I had ADHD, I like am just leaning into that right now. Of it doesn't have to be hard and it doesn't have to have a lot of choice or flexibility. Like if it works, it works. 
Yeah. You're just being kinder to yourself too, right? Yeah. Yeah. And frankly, like outsourcing the things that I can't keep up with. And I know I'm very lucky to be able to do some of that. But like, if I get behind on the laundry, I schedule a fluff and fold. (laughs) I just, I have two young kids and I can't keep up with everything. So yeah, that's part of being kind to yourself. And yeah, why the hell are the women always the ones feeling guilty about that? Right? Like a a guy would never think twice about, oh my God, I've got laundry. Like they probably wouldn't even do it themselves ever. (laughs) Right. And everybody would think (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So thank you again, Laura, so much. So I always ask, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? I'm assuming we should send them to that Instagram account. Is that what you want to do? Yes. Okay. Say it again. It is Y W H Y underscore I underscore A I Y I A I. And it's an account that I think will be super helpful for people that are just looking for like practical ways to get started with AI. Wonderful. We will have that in our show notes as well as, you know, the apps that Laura was talking about. Laura, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. I am so inspired to really go out and make this work for me. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And I really look forward to talking more in the community about ways that we can all help each other with this as well. Thank you. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Laura, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. Before I go, don't forget to check out my live coaching program, Your ADHD Brain is A-OK. Remember, it also includes a private community of women just like you. You can find out more information at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash AOK. And if you sign up right now with the code podcast SASS, S-A-S-S, you'll get $500 off just for being a podcast listener. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.